about these ecosystems. And so my contention here is that there's a lot that we've forgotten about how people interact with their environments and that we can look to changes in vegetation cover and climate and the archeological record to start to unpack this. So I kind of, I want to take you on this journey uh, through my own research in the Congo ba Basin re region of Central Africa. And what, what is really interesting about studying human impacts specifically is that there's this sort of, um, there's this paradox that on one hand, like human impacts in the present are, are, are ubiquitous. We see them everywhere we go. So this photo is just of the surface of uh, the Congo, a tributary of the Congo River. But just beneath the surface there, there is bits of cloth, there's bits of plastic, uh, there's people reflected in the water themselves. Everywhere we look, we find people. And if you go at, you know, a geochemical scale and look at, you know, the composition of carbon isotopes, we see that we've, you know, changed that by using fossil fuels. We see that, uh, you know, you can look for microplastics and find them in some of the deepest parts of the ocean and also in the Swiss Alps. So on one hand, we're everywhere in the present, but if we look at sort of the scientific archeological and paleo we call ecological literature, there's a lot of debate about whether or not people even had an impact on some of these environments and when it might've happened, which kind of leaves us in a position of not being able to answer some fundamental questions. And we're really sort of, we're grounded again in this present moment, having forgotten what people used to know. So if we look at a place like Central Africa, the way the, the vegetation types that have been defined for that region have been set for something like 30, 40 years. Um, and a lot of that based on just colonial era historic observations. And you don't have to read these paragraphs, but they define the sort of the rainforest zone as being pristine, and then this band around it as being extensively destroyed by fire and cultivation. So already from the start, we have this definition of wilderness as a non-human place, Rainforest is natural, not touched. And outside of it is all this, this degradation and, and damage caused by people. So at the very first instance, we have already adopted a, a way of looking at the environment and the people that occupy it. And that translates into the way that we do research. And so <clears throat> because they're looking at this present moment where farmers are burning burning the landscape and it's associated with wooded savannas and it sort of stands in this juxtaposition with rainforests. As we go backwards in time, when we see the sort of material uh, accoutrement of farming or just like that, that complex material culture that tends to show up with people that cultivate food like ceramics, grinding stones, uh, you know, sedentary evidence for sedentism, that gets turned into, well, that's agriculture like we see it today this very thin veneer of, of historic observational, you know, that sits on top of the geologic past. And that ends up meaning that we also infer like, okay, these are farmers like we see farmers and they have impacts like we expect to see the impacts of farmers. And especially in, in systems where people use Sweden agriculture, so that's just using fire to recycle nutrients from the above ground biomass into the soil. And uh, it, so it sets us up basically expecting, well, it's, you know, human impacts are a function of population density and of, of sedentism then. And this is all in pursuit of, of trying, to, trying to fill your mouth and fill your belly. Looking at the present across Central Africa, this map uh, on the right hand side that you see is tracking fire activity using satellites. It's published in this, this really interesting paper by Bowman et al. And what they show basically is that this area around Africa's tropical rainforest is one of the most burned places on planet Earth. There are more fires here than virtually anywhere else. Every year, like clockwork. And you can actually, so if you can, if you ever have the time to look on uh, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration's website, NOAA.gov, they occasionally can, uh, will have, have gifts of, um, atmospheric transport and you can basically see the smoke coming off this part of the world every year and so as we are you know getting used to seeing catastrophic wildfires in the news we tend to look at these ones the same way and it opens up a question which that the paper that i'm citing brings up is that we don't really know how far back in time that goes is that a natural phenomenon that comes with the vegetation cover or is this something that people have created in the recent past or in the deeper past and there's another interesting observation sort of 
but with, with the an emphasis on the recent past, in the last hundred years, in this same part of Central Africa, there's actually been afforestation in some areas. So as opposed to these fires being like absolutely catastrophic, bring, bringing down the geographic area of the rainforest, we see that actually in some areas it's growing and in some of the same areas it's burning. Now there's vast swaths of West Africa that are really, really deforested. And that's certainly a combination of, of, of humans and the environment. The Central African bloc is really behaving rather differently. And that's where uh, most of my research has been focused is that, is that central zone. Oh, I've gone one too far. There we are, I'm giving away my jokes. <clears throat> so what we end up with then because we have sort of a shallow frame of reference based on history and historical observations, but we have this deep past of people in Africa, we tend to project all that backwards. And so we have, uh, we, we sort of imagine a sort of simple linear connections here. So in this slide, you can see, you know, some sort of climate change, a change in vegetation cover, and then a change in human land use. And the direction, the arrows only go one direction. So things get dry, it means more savannas, means humans evolve and we get hominid diversity like this is and this is to illustrate how how sort of pervasive these ideas are uh, if you go to the middle holocene something like five or six thousand years ago um you have the end of this green sahara period which is really interesting uh things are much much more humid across north africa so you have there's rock art depicting hippopotamus and crocodiles and things in what is now the sahara desert and that gets, we attribute pottery and pastoralism to the end of that phase. So things aren't getting as good. So people invest in these, these sort of niche technologies. Then the last one, uh, you know, we have these late Holocene, the last 3000 years, uh, something that some scholars call the, the rainforest crisis. So an arid event that supposedly shrunk the rainforest down to an, about the same area that they expected during the last glacial maximum. So 20,000 some odd years ago. And that gets linked directly to uh, one of the largest demographic events on, on planet Earth, which is this thing called the Bantu expansion. And that's basically the movement and dispersal of people out of sort of central West Africa across all of sub-Saharan Africa. And I argue that this logic is sort of, um, I'm, I'm confident a lot of you are absolutely familiar with the television show South Park, but it's a satirical comedy. And at some point, these, the, the young children that are the subjects of the show discover that their underwear and socks are going missing, as many of us do when we're young. And then they discover that the underpants gnomes are taking them. And so I call this underpants gnomes logic, because when the boys approach the underpants gnomes about why, they say, well, phase one, we're going to collect underpants. Phase two, phase three, profit. And so there are sort of simple models for how people in the environment interact have a similar tendency. We find some sort of wiggle in environmental data. You say, oh, there's this change at some point in time. And then, I don't know. And then we speculate about human impacts. So you say, oh, well, it gets drier without thinking through the specifics of how that, and that environment responds to aridity and the sort of like adaptive characteristics of people who are extremely flexible. So these, unim these unimodal models don't really work for us and they go, two directions for this part of the world. So you see some groups of archeologists arguing that uh, in the case of the two papers shown here, that there is this sudden change in vegetation, in the environment, and that that is linked with people. And so people have caused this, this rainforest crisis roughly 3000 years ago. And you can go to the opposite camp who uses roughly the same logic. They find a wiggle in the paleo environmental data and just say the opposite. They say that climate drove this collapse in human populations. On the left is a typical sort of pollen diagram just showing vegetation through time. And on the, uh, on the right hand side then are what's supposed to be inferred as human population densities based on the number of radiocarbon dates. So that's a lot of extrapolating, but uh, just to say that we do this thing called wiggle matching. We say, well, we've got, I got a thing here and something else that looks like it, but we haven't thought through process and interaction to imagine how the two interact with each other because obviously climate change, climate change and cultural change are happening at the same time. So how do we begin to unpack these in a way that's useful for reconstructing past environments and past human behaviors, and then for making some sort of inference about what we do for, for the future. And so I argue for 
uh, sort of closing the loop. So when we imagine these impacts happening, it's actually, it, there's, a, there's these feedbacks between human land use and its impact on vegetation cover, which shapes future human land use. And at the same time, vegetation cover is responding to climate change. But you can connect that loop as well because vegetation cover changes surface albedo. It changes the concentration of moisture in the atmosphere via respiration. The Congo rainforest is so vast that it can create some of its own rainfall just via respiration. So that moisture ends up being extensively recycled across the forest zone and beyond it. So it not only is a wet environment, but it creates more wet environments. I somehow keep ending up just off of it and then and it gives me that awful ding. So you'll forgive me for that. So when we think about trying to unpack these problems for tropical Africa, I sort of asked two questions, two different sets of questions. Like one is conceptually, are we creating falsifiable hypotheses? Meaning that are we creating something that can be tested and replicated with the data that we're measuring? And then are we creating realistic models for how people interact with the environment? So our idea about, you know, Bantu, Bantu peoples, they adopt agriculture and metallurgy, and then just in a tidal wave flood across Sub-Saharan Africa, cutting down everything they can find in front of them, doesn't strike me as terribly realistic, having spent time in that part of the world. And, and then also growing up in an, an agricultural household myself, I'm a first generation college student, I've watched people garden and they don't just cut down every little thing. So there's got us, you know, we've, taken this impression of, of modern farmers or even industrial agriculture and forced it on the distant past. So how can we maybe come up with more re realistic models for how people interact with their environment? And you can flip that over to thinking about paleoecology. So on the right hand side here is a map showing every core with pollen data from this part of West Central Africa. And there's quite a few of them. But you can see some really conspicuous gaps in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the middle. Um, and you can fit Texas in one of those gaps. So for this vast area of rainforest, there's actually surprisingly little data. And we have to ask ourselves, are we sampling records that are sensitive to these human impacts at all? So for people who tend to work in paleoecology, you search for some sort of high altitude lake and take a very nice, well-stratified core from it and reconstruct global climate change because those are regionally sensitive. Those same records may not be sensitive to human activities because those records don't exist where the people are. And then last, do we have sufficient archeological data to resolve relevant questions about how people use the landscape? And that one's really hard to get to, um, but it means we have to start looking for what did the things that people ate. We have to think very hard about how much of their diet, the things they ate made up, the different components like wild versus domesticated. Um, so there's a lot of extra details to add there and working in a place like Central Africa, there's obviously a lot of work to do. So I'm going to bombard you with uh, a bit of photo essay and a little bit of scientific results here. So I wanna walk you through uh, some of the areas that I've worked over the last handful of years and show you some preliminary results and uh, interjected in them will be some of the fossils we found, some, uh, and, then, and then photos of the different landscapes. So let's start off. So our goal then, because these, these two data sets, the paleo environments and the archeology span have some disconnects. Uh, I have a PhD in anthropology but have spent the last, basically the last 10 years working as a, as a microbotanist. And I, at the moment, feel like I sort of bridged the two fields. So for a lot of this work, we worked with both botanists and archeologists and whenever possible, uh, geographers and geologists. So it ended up being uh, as many people as we could fit in a dugout canoe and then take them off into uh, the forests of Central Africa. So these, the different text and red points here are just sampling locations. So we, what we tried to do was take a boat uh, wherever we could and document the archeology span and then try to take some sediment cores, both at the archeological sites themselves and then offsite. So we're gonna start, I got a slide out of order here. You will forgive me. Oh, I got two slides out of order, so get ready for one more. But this is this is a LIDAR view of an archaeological site called Iyonda. And it's just meant to show 
that there's actually a really substantial prehistoric occupation here. It runs back the last couple thousand years. So some of the first people using ceramics and domesticated foods that settled this part of Central Africa were passed through this place and set up camps. So we have charred remains of cowpeas, of pearl millet, uh, and then these really interesting features on the very far left there, you can see uh, a profile of a pit feature. And so there's these sort of nested pits that have uh, whole pots and partial pots in them, uh, a combination of both like mid and like normal everyday refuse, and then apparently some, some uh, intentional interments of, of broken artifacts. So they, they, they sort of span both the ritual and the mundane. Uh, you can see a really lovely ceramic piece in the bottom center there. And it's a reasonably, uh, the excavate, the, sorry, the, the colluvium where we're finding these things goes very, very deep. Uh, you can see uh, Dirk Zeidensticker, one of my German colleagues, in the bottom of an excavation unit in that, in that top center photo. And this is supposed to be the first slide for this to give you some context, but this is at the immediate area around the village of Iyonda. So in the map, uh, the map is based on uh, vegetation data gathered by satellites by the European Space Agency. Uh, the red areas that you see are, are essentially urban areas where there's just a lot of uh, actual buildings. And then the orange and yellow are, are more or less uh, open areas with either agriculture or naturally or unnaturally occurring savannas. And what's interesting about this area is we have, so it has all that archaeological data in it, and, pardon? We decided to take a core from this small drainage that runs just past the archaeological site. This entire area, I'll page back to this map, there's a lot of villages on this south bank of the Congo River. So where you're seeing the red in the north, and then these, the dots marked on the map, there's a, a ridge of, of laterite, a very hard uh, sedimentary, uh, basically a sedimentary rock that lies along that whole area. And it protects it from the, the erosion of the Congo River there. So you have this wide ridge and then everything to the east of it, like from that immediate zone drains to the east, except for these like handful of small drainages. So. You can see in the middle of the map there, our coring location, the set of red buildings, uh, and the open area just off of center is where the archaeological site is. And so we think people were settling there because at the edge of that laterite crust is usually where fresh water comes out so that you find springs there that feed these small channels. And what's cool about this one, if you go to low water conditions, you can see the old sand bank. And so this is, uh, every year it's inundated, but you have this sort of protected region in the middle there by that sand bank that's collecting all the material coming out of that small channel. So this gives us an excellent opportunity to look at what, look at what people are up to on that landscape with the environmental record. And then just some shots of the actual area itself. So to get into it, uh, well, sorry, in the, in the, drier season when the water is lower, you get this very discreet lagoon that shows up in it. And uh, people's cows will come down here and drink. There's cattle herding going on in the area now. And then if you go into that channel and hang a sharp left, you can see our coring site, which is really, it's fed just by that very small stream you see coming out in the middle of the colored photo now. And it's surrounded by vegetation, which is stabilizing this bank and holding together the material that we were after. At high water, the, the sand bank is mostly inundated and the Congo River itself sort of gently laps at, at your feet at the exact spot we were taking the core. So it's a good spot to catch this, this very hyper local signal of what was going on at the archaeological site. So taking cores is always a gamble because you never necessarily know how old it is. In this case, we got lucky. I want to draw your, uh, so this, the big image on the right hand side there is in basically a, uh, an illustration of how the depth of the sediments relate to age. So those blue zones are radiocarbon dates and you compare out where they fall out along the core to, to roughly figure out where you should be in time at any given position. 
And what you can see in the actual images and in my illustration of them is that there's these massive chunks of charcoal in it as well. And so this being an area where they were certainly making iron, it, it makes it uh, a, a sort of tantalizing record for looking at the way that people impacted this environment. So all of this is ongoing. Pollen counting is happening when I'm not working in a lab or watching my toddler during quarantine. What we do have, um, and this is, I don't know how many uh, pollen-based talks any of you have seen, but on the top here are, are uh, fossil pollen grains. And so when plants reproduce, they produce cells that can that, that hold half their DNA, right? And so these guys are made out of this very durable compound called sporal pollenin. It preserves really well as long as they stay wet. So in a place like tropical Africa, that's usually usually a safe bet. And because these fossils are distinctive to the genus of the plant, in a lot of cases, and sometimes to the species, as you can see on the far right, is Canarium schwanberthii. Uh, we can we can buy we can use those to make inferences about what the climate used to be like and the, and the conditions on the landscape. So in this case, this figure is uh, this slide is comparing different fossil pollen types with the distribution of those plants currently across sub-Saharan Africa. So on the left, Irvingia is a, a relatively large rainforest tree. It's common along waterways. Uh, Hymenocardia in the middle is mostly a shrub or a short tree. It really likes fire and it really likes disturbance. And you can see that it's widespread across Sub-Saharan Africa. So it is not picky about where it lives. And then the far right canarium tends to be a little bit more picky about, about where it lives. It likes the rainforest zone, but also likes it to be somewhat seasonal, which is why you can see it sort of peeking past the rainforest zone itself in that, in that bottom right map. You can compare the three of them over time. What we see from the bottom to the top of the core, uh, this bar graph just shows this expanding zone of, of yellow and the loss of canarium. So interesting is interesting to note that Irvingia is more or less stable. It does have some wide fluctuations, but it doesn't vanish from the record or anything. So we see some of the seasonal qualities disappear, the canarium prefers, and then this explosion of things that prefer light and the preferred disturbance. So, which is about what we'd expect at a, a, from a core right next to an archeological site. This last one is complicated, but I had to throw it in there. Um, all I wanna point you to is that uh, we would expect that before people got there, this is a really diverse environment. So what this graph compares is the number of things. So on your Y axis, as you go up and down, as you go from bottom to top, you're finding more different sorts of things, that biodiversity. And along the x-axis, as you go left to right, it's just the number of different things you find. If everything you find is a new thing, you create this sort of linear, extremely diverse straight line. So our expectation here is that the time before people show up at the archeological site should all be very low. And that while people are there, diversity should go down. That's not what's happening. So right in the middle, you can see IYO106, which is a sample really close to the top of the core, which is certainly there during when people are there. And the diversity is just as high, if not higher than a lot of the other samples. So we're not finding compelling evidence for this utter destruction of the environment. What we're finding is a balance between disturbance and settlement of those disturbed areas by different types of vegetation cover. So we're gonna shift our focus to Bolondo, another set of villages. So this, by getting to this place, takes about two days in a dugout canoe, all day, and maybe maybe a nap. But after two days, you land at Bolondo. Uh, what's, what, just a couple of things to draw out to you from this map. Um, there is one of the phrases of 2020 is where's the pointer? And I always struggle to find that in Zoom and I'm just gonna leave it be. Um, you can see the, the one point BLD 100 sits right next to the river and then there's a red dot further off in the vast green of the Congo Basin. So there's a village site right next to the Shuapa River. And then you can follow, you can just faintly see a channel linking that, that village next to the river with the hinterland. And that's this small channel that runs through this, this vast floodplain that surrounds this river. And it's covered in this really amazing swamp forest. So we're gonna follow that path 
uh, in photos at the moment. So uh, the Shuap is really, you know, you, you look at it on a map, you say, oh, it's just a little river, but it's, it's massive. It's a, it's a pretty wide river. It can be about a uh, half a kilometer across at different points, um, which being, I grew up in, in Utah, so that seems like a really big river to me. And all along this river, there are villages tucked into that bit of forest. And a lot of these tend to be seasonal camps. So people show up there, they, they fish a whole bunch, they smoke all the fish and then take it to market and they're out of there by the time the water comes up again. And what was interesting about Bolondo is that it's, uh, as far as it's been observed in the 1980s when it was visited by a German archeological team and then when our entire team came back in, in 2016, it's permanently occupied. People are there year round. And the, the village is really something of an island. So you can see the vegetation come up behind it, but it actually slopes off behind it. And this island, ooh, there'll be some more images of that later. The island is essentially uh, artificial. It's made up of layers of the archeological site of Bolondo going back something like 500 years. So it's not a terribly old archeological site, but we get a really clear picture here of how people have, have built up and modified this environment in a very direct sort of way. And so you can also travel back behind the village into the flooded zone. We were there during the, during the, during the wet season. So it was really pretty rainy, the water was high and you could ride a canoe across almost all of that floodplain, and it really created these enchanting views of you know just massive rainforest trees of this dark canopy and then the water is um if you hike in many of the parks around tampa bay you'll see that dark sort of humic acid rich water that indicates peat deposits which is which is pay dirt for people who do paleoecology because it tends to preserve uh microfossils like pollen really really well I'm going to page you back at that map just for a moment so you can look at close to that that red point to the north there's just a tiny smidge of yellow and it is this area which was of great interest to us because uh it's it's obviously something very different across that that patch of rainforest and some local informants have told us that it was uh there used to be elephants who visited it until they were sort of hunted out in the last 10 years or so but the vegetation remains re relatively stable, but just as an example of sort of the diversity of vegetation cover you encounter. So you can be in, in this very deep forest at one moment and then all along the same channel here is this little island of savanna. So uh, it's of interest to know when it forms, when this might've formed and, and who might've been responsible. So the archeological site itself, um, I wanted to show you on the left-hand side there, you can see some of the house floor, uh, the, of the most recent house floor in a post hole in the far left photo in the profile. And it goes all the way down into uh, the water table. And then we used a coring device to punch down another 60, 70 centimeters. So you see sort of the base of the occupation is the dark area. So now we're talking about the, the sediment core just to the right of that labeled BLD 100. The dark area is the last of the midden, and then it hits sand, which has some artifacts still, and then a sterile sort of sandy clay. And just behind the site, so these the photo to the right there is just, just off of the village, uh, it, proper in an area that was later, someone later told me it was the latrine, so I was excited to go. I was, I was glad I was out there mucking around, taking cores. Uh, but this also had these really interesting, we got about uh, a meter's worth of deposit that contain artifacts and the same sort of household layers. So it's really, this covers a, a relatively substantial area of this village site and these floors are, are pervasive both on site and then just off of site. It covers an area of something like uh, almost half a football field, which is good for a relatively small village like that. I know for people who work in some, pro some proper Southeastern context, they like, ah, it's nothing, but for this part of the Congo Basin and for a, a village built at the very edge of the river like that, it's really pretty interesting. And those deposits dating to about the last 400 years, uh, we got a basal date at 400 years BP, it covers almost the entire sequence of the site. Um, I'm not going to present uh, like all, all of all of the data, but what we're finding out of it that's really interesting is in the middle photo of that column of photos in the center is a fungal spore. 
And some of these are coming from coprophilic fungi, meaning uh, fungi that prefer to grow on dung, animal dung specifically, uh, every, animal dung. It's a way to narrow it down, Katipas. Uh, they grow on herbivore dung. And what's fascinating about that is some of the archeological material uh, looks like goat bones. So we have this sort of man-made site at the edge of the river. People are keeping goats there. They're certainly cultivating things like pearl millet uh, relatively late in time, the last 500 years. So, um, and then at the same time, the, the rest of the pollen record, that uppermost pollen grain is from a, a, a rainforest, a, a tree that grows only in sort of the shaded canopy of the rainforest, which is still occurring at the site. So it's still a rainforest zone, but people are doing all those intensive uh, economic things like, uh, like using metal goods, cultivating, cereals and and eating domesticated animals so despite all that not, we're not seeing some sort of widespread impact at that particular that that particular location but if you go back into that swamp forest zone uh here's some of those peak deposits and so really just as you cut beneath the surface you get into a couple of meters of of peat and what we found so far, after a number of radiocarbon dates, you can see, given their spread here, uh, even, even if you're not necessarily a professional archeologist, that's bad. The spread of them is not, not awfully compelling, but that the bottom of the core came into a single piece of wood. So what it looks like is we have several dates that line up. Uh, so if you're looking at the diagram from left to right, uh, moving across the x-axis, we have a bunch of stuff that's the same age. And then as we move upwards, we finally start to move towards the present. So there's some sort of event around 2,500 years ago, which really throws a wrench in my general critique of this rainforest crisis thing. But uh, it's it's very fascinating to have, have a core from something where you had like one major flood event or something happen and then deposition resume afterwards. Because the surrounding area is mostly sand and we tried coring inside of that grassy area and it really didn't give us very much. It was, it was sand top to bottom. And then here, uh, a fairly ubiquitous rainforest signal dump. Still even in those bottom deposits, uh, here's an example of Obengia. It's, a, it's from the, the family Lesiopidiaceae, and it's specific to Central Africa. It was really exciting to finally confirm this identification from the fossils, but this is a, a tree specific to this part of Congo and some of the Central African Republic. But it's indicated, it indicates, <clears throat> excuse me, these sort of densely forested environments. Uh, now we're gonna shift over to Lake Mayan Dombe, a totally different depositional context. And uh, this bottom left window of my maps, dang, I, these maps are really great. I should have explained them better. But that bottom left window is tracking where our sites compare with uh, different uh, ceramic traditions known from the region. So we're based, we're off the known map at the moment. We have very little archeology span from this area, uh, but there are a handful of tantalizing stone tool sites in the area, which might indicate some sort of deeper time occupation of people at that region, which is cool. And Mayan Dombe uh, is a long north-south trending lake it's relatively shallow compared to other, other lakes, especially places like the, the, the Great Rift Valley. And as you look, the very left side of this photo, you're looking north. And north to south, you really can't see all the way uh, um, across the lake. But east-west, you definitely can. But there's a few hundred thousand people that make their living out in that area. Um, and what caught my eye from the beginning of our field work there is that the shorelines are, are uncovering all this old wood um, so that those shoreline deposits are doing a reasonable job of preserving organic material, which would mean that somewhere in these regions around Mayan Dome, you might get reasonable cores that go back a little further in time. And we had hoped for something like uh, this is a little further north along Mayan Dombe. So you have these nice sandy shores. And then in other locations, you have an area where the swamp basically meets the edge of the river. So these are protected from erosional forces by a laterite crust that sort of sticks out and creates a lagoon. And behind that, uh, you have just this photo showing you a shelf of, of swamp. 
and it's really mo like as you try to walk across it it's it's extremely soft it's mostly just rotting organic material which was uh hugely exciting because that's that's what preserves pollen uh and in in this case uh, our our sort of age depth relationship showed us something shocking which is that we have these sandy deposits in the bottom so if you follow your x y Sorry, if you follow the x-axis left to right at the bottom, it starts at 22,000 years ago. So at this point, we had our first, the first indication that these deposits could give us a window into the ice age and what vegetation looked like in this part of the world then. And uh, another core further to the north gave us not just a sandy deposit, but it gave us one of these dense uh, peatland deposits at about 25,000 years ago, which is the heart of the last glacial maximum. It's a phase that should be relatively dry in this part of the world, but here we are, we have, uh, we have marsh in this lake area. So that might represent this really unique environment uh, culturally with the, the hints we have about the archeology, span but it's certainly uh, unique in terms of its geomorphology and how that impacts vegetation cover there. I'd like to point out just one more thing from these, paging back quickly. Uh, the series of dates across this core, some of them coming from 6,000, 4,000 years ago towards the middle of the core, uh, come from charcoal, really large chunks of charcoal. And this core was taken not far from at least a historic village site. Um, so there's a tantalizing possibility here. Uh, because it's not really a fire-prone environment, you'd wonder where that charcoal at four and 6,000 years ago comes from. All right, and then last, my last, last tour destination for the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, is the region around Imbonga. And it's the, this village, um, the oldest ceramic tradition in, in this part of Central Africa is named after the village of Imbonga. Uh, and that tradition dates about uh, 2,800 years ago or so. Again, some of the first people to arrive in this area who made pots and who who likely pra practice some form of cultivation. And so we have two separate sets of sampling sites here, but one of them, uh, and they're, they're relatively similar in terms of topography. And these are these strange, large lobe-like fans at the edge of the, the, the sort of upland forest massif. So instead of it just being, you know, upland to river, you have upland, it slopes down to this like sort of domey shaped swamp and then in the middle of that, there's another river channel and then the flow of these really meandery, narrow uh, tropical rainforest river. So a really, really unique geology and, and uh, an opportunity to get a look at the bigger picture. Uh, extremely densely vegetated. So whereas some uh, Mayan Dome Bay was mostly open and it was easy to get to some of the sampling locations because you could just use river to cut up, this was uh, several kilometers of walking through knee deep mud to get just as far as we could into any of those locations. And every, you know, every maneuver we tried, we were, all, we, we were still in this very, very wet inundated uh, swamp. But at the same time, uh, still people there at all the entrances to the trails that led in there, there were at least like some sort of temporary hut or another. So further in that juxta juxtaposition of you walk in and say, the environment I see now tells me that, uh, you know, this is just pristine, this is natural, but um, there's all these clues on your way in and on your way out that the people have had an impact there. And then just some nice shots. I put this one in just because I really like this tree. This is, uh, this is probably Uapaka guineensis. It's a large rainforest tree that prefers these sort of swampy environments. So uh, if you wanted to imagine a day in my life in the field, it's renting a canoe early in the morning, uh, like a tiny pirogue, so a very narrow thing. You can just barely sort of uh, fit yourself in in a camera case. And we take those as far as we can get into these zones, hop out and walk. And one of the clues we look for is a vegetation cover. And this, when you see a tree with these giant stilt roots, which is uh, something you see in some of these awesome parks around Tampa Bay, um, you know you're dealing with changing water tables. And so this is a zone that gets inundated every year and that's a good sign because it means the right sort of deposits will occur there. And you push even further into uh, that sort of dome feature, so at the edge of it is where you encounter those trees and then the middle of it, it is almost entirely dominated by this, uh, by a palm tree called, uh, um, it's raffia and I can't think of the exact species of it now. Um, oh, it escapes me. 
Either way, um, a palm from the genus Raffia. And so it grows wild here uh, and it grows very like stout. So it's a palm tree that's just palm fronds top to bottom and it's at most probably about, you know, three or four meters high. It's the closest thing I've, I've uh, the only thing I've been through quite like walking through this is trying to hike through mangroves. And at that particular sampling location, uh, it yielded a very fascinating record. We collected about three meters of deposit out of just outside of Mbonga in the swamp forest zone. And it, the basal date came back about almost 40,000 years ago, which is now or beyond uh, the terminal Pleistocene into a couple of these glacial interglacial events, which is really, really exciting because it's our first window on the rainforest at that point in time. And again, this um, basal date comes from charcoal. So an environment that isn't typically very fire prone, uh, here we have fire activity marking it as far back as 40,000 years ago. Um, so, and it, it, it a, a, a quick aside about that, if you talked with people working in the Amazon at the moment and said, I have a core from a swamp forest the, and there's this chunk of charcoal in it, they'd say, oh, that was people, that was fire. It would make us they just on the basis that the rainforest is not supposed to be a fire prone environment. Um, but if you ask Africanists, you would you would get the opposite response that there was like there had to be some sort of like massive climate change that caused a lightning strike that caused a fire that caused that piece of charcoal. Um, but given like the, the long tenure people in Africa and the long tenure people in the tropical rainforest, it's uh, it's sort of a toss up if you ask me. All right. With that, I will leave you with a view of uh, a partial solar eclipse on the Congo River. And thank you very much for your kind attention and for your time. Um, and let's move on to questions. I have to figure out how to stop screen sharing first. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do sometimes. No, it's it's the combination of maximizing my PowerPoint and having zoom on, it makes my mouse cursor disappear. And they hide it at the top, so it's a little difficult to see. And it's also that, okay. All right, so does anyone have a question? Well, first though, ah, I earned that. <laughs> you definitely did. All right, if you've got a question, type it in the chat um, and we'll, we'll ask the question. I didn't see any come through on the way, except for some specific questions about how to spell some of the locations, um, which might take a little more time than a, you know, just a Q&A. <laughs> yeah, spelling, um, it's interesting, you find a lot of like, these sort of post-colonial shifts in the spelling. So if you ask some locals, you get one spelling, and if you consult your map, you'll get another. Well, I, I while we're waiting, I have a question just about sure. kind of your, your field, you know, experience. So, you know, how long did you take trips there? How, how long, you know, have you gone once, twice, gone back annually? How often were you there? And how long did you stay? And where did you stay? Those are great questions. Um, so for these trips, we, um, well, the, the stuff I presented here represents four separate field campaigns. So four times packing everything up, getting out there and setting up and, and getting to work. Um, in the case of the Mayan Dome Bay work, it was, it was a little bit easier because we could fly to uh, a pretty large village near the lake uh, from Kinshasa, the capital of DR Congo. So it was basically you fly in, you land in Kinshasa, you have to fight through the world's worst traffic jam that exists forever and always between the airport and the downtown. And you stay there and then catch a local flight. And so you can do it in a couple of days, show up, stay a night, fly to Nongo the next day, and then you're on, on my Dome Bay in a couple hours. And that's that's relatively easy. The other work, was a lot harder. So that required, we have to catch a flight to a village. Uh, we would stage our stuff out of Iyonda. So that, that first core was convenient because we, we would stay at a Catholic mission there. And so they had an equipment locker for us that we could keep locked up. So we would ship stuff there, it would get locked away and the priests would take care of it. And they were very kind to do so. Um, <clears throat> they also kept a small stash of cold beer. So important to know where to find that. 
And then um, they were located right next to this archeological site. So, it, which was good because it took a lot of arranging to get into the interior. So in that case, we had to get a dugout canoe. We had to get permission from the local government. And so someone would come inspect your dugout canoe, which is always sort of, because it's, it's a dugout canoe with an outboard motor, what's to inspect. But you had local bureaucrats you had to take care of and they wanted, if there were foreigners there, like you were expected to help out a little bit. So you'd go through all that, get in a boat and then travel to these locations and then just stay on a sandbar. If we happen to not encounter a village, you would find somewhere open to sleep and then quickly get up in the morning, pack up and, and head for the nearest village. And then usually during field, like actual field work itself, we're staying in a village, we've made arrangements with uh, local leaders and then even sort of the regional government to, to be there, you've gotten their permission and then there's sort of blessing to be on the landscape. And then we stay with those guys and eat what the locals eat. Well, I bet that in itself was just an experience, you know, the, the archeology span and your research aside, just being in Africa and experiencing the people and the different travel, having having dug out canoes inspected sounds interesting. Yeah, getting to um, be on the Congo River itself and hang out in the small villages is, is like a, is a rare pleasure. It's just a, a really, really cool experience. People are extremely welcoming um, and you get you get such a, such a more realistic picture of what the place is like, I think. And also opportunities to see what people eat. Like I love those tiny markets. I, I go through those with my camera just to see what, what plants are people cultivating, collecting and selling. A little bit of ethnography while you're there, right? Seeing what people- Yeah, eat. well, I mean, absolutely. And that's it. That's the point about um, sort of like, what well, are models realistic? Well, you have to see how people actually grow and cultivate food in that environment, yeah. which is helpful. I see some things coming through in the question. Yes, there are. Um, I was going to ask first, before we get into the archaeology question, someone asked if you saw any crocodiles while you were there. I saw, kind, I didn't see like the classic big crocodiles. So there has been, um, the impacts on wildlife recently have been really, really stark. So it is not the Congo River one would imagine from Heart of Darkness. And talking with my, <laughs> my German colleague, who was there a lot in the 19th, he did these like six and nine month long field campaigns, which are, are, are bonkers. I can't even imagine that. We would do something like four or five weeks. Um, but he said he saw tons and tons of hippos and crocodiles on the river, and we didn't see one. Interesting. After quite a bit of river travel, yeah. So there's, there's been the, the demand for, for bushmeat is really, really high. Gotcha. Okay, uh, here we have one from Marcy Connors, who's one of our board members. She asked where all the cores ended up. Did you leave them in Africa or did you ship them to the USA? And if you did ship them, how, how did you transport? How did you move them around? Good question. So for some of the field work, we um, sampled the cores in the field to at least get them in a box so that we could bring that back to Europe and then ship it to the US from there. You can't hand carry sediments international sediment uh, into the United States. It has to be shipped under a USDA soil permit. And then for some of the, the work, I spent a year working in Germany. So when we and collected a bunch of these cores for that job, and those cores are in Europe right now. And those actually, we collected the whole core, we put it in a PVC pipe, uh, we used saran wrap to seal it up and duct tape, of course, labeling the outside. So we knew which way it was top and bottom. And then those went in about a meter long aluminum case that just gets shipped back to Europe. And it has worked most of the time really effectively. Our latest coring effort, they actually, uh, there's been issues with getting it shipped here. So it's been about eight months that that poor case has sat, sat somewhere waiting to get shipped out here. Um, that can be a little daunting, can't it? Because you spent all that time gathering it. So now you're just, it's like your baby that you're waiting on, right? Yeah, this one was actually really exciting. It was from like really far north on the Congo River. We took about a six day trip just to get there. And then, yeah, to have it held up at customs is, 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 is bad. But there's also a lot of, uh, it's not as bad as, as what international politics does to Congo. So I'll, I'll say that much and that I, I don't wanna be unfair to either the locals or the people I've worked with, but they, there's not like a lot of understanding between the two at the moment. But it's a difficult history. It's a super difficult history between places like Belgium, which we've worked with and, and Congo. So that's, those are tough waters and you have to be patient to navigate it. Thankfully the cores are really well sealed. So I hold out hope that it'll come back in, in good shape. 
Well, that's good. Yeah. We've got another one that's specific. Let's see. Um, Christine asked at one of your sites, I believe it was the second one, there was an occupied village site in what appeared to be an island environment. You said the current occupants are actually living on an archaeological site from 500 years ago. Do you know how they artificially manipulated that environment to be able to create that island? Did they bring sand in from nearby to create it? Uh, I think you've got this combination of it's not really a depositional environment there. So at some point, um, but there is the mouth of that stream. So there might have been like a small river delta there that you could occupy at low water. And I think just the refuse built up and the location was so useful that, that uh, as as the people built up the local environment around it, they uh, it became a place they could permanently occupy and they did because they could. So not necessarily them showing up saying, I wanna build an island, but uh, more or less the outcomes of like all of the house building and house deconstruction just deconstruction uh, leads to sort of the build of the material there. Okay. But they are preparing house floors. So that, that takes like, they're, they're putting a little bit of effort into that. So at like the, the year to year level, they're like, yeah, we need another layer of clay. And then little by little that builds up. Oh, great. Thanks, Chris. All right, so next, um, Jim Bays asked, uh, he said, some of your graphs showed erosional discon, oh, of course I can't give it out, discon, Discontinuities. Thank you, discontinuities. Yeah. Um, at that period in time, do they correspond to other significant climate events or are they just severe local floods? I would like to compliment Jim on his keen eye. Um, there are erosional discontinuities and that's actually like one of our, our big research questions we've been trying to approach is if they're actually erosional discontinuities or a hiatus in sedimentation. So for everyone, the difference is like, um, we get these places where the, the radio car, you have two separate dates that are showing up at the same time. So that would imply that there's very old and, and younger material, you know, right next to each other. So does that happen because uh, there was erosion that, that deleted it? So the two are next to each other now, or is just, did things get, say, dry or sedimentation slow down so much that you, you really do have a time span that's continuous, but it's just occurring very, very slowly. Um, and those do appear to time with some climatic events, especially at the early Holocene and the late Holocene. And so we've been, we're actually pursuing that question now by analyzing some of the organic. Uh, we, we have colleagues in France who, who want to look at the organic molecules in the peat itself and look for traces of uh, like oxidation or other sorts of like in situ decomposition versus um, Oh, they had they had another example for that, but they're basically trying to look at the, the decay of it and what that might mean for the causes of the erosional discontinuities or, or sedimentary hiatuses. All right, and then uh, Jay Hardman asks, uh, you showed tree species and a fungal spore. Did your research incorporate onset and distribution of horticultural species? Um... Well, I'm, I'm not, maybe if Jay could clarify it a little bit, like we are absolutely looking for any sort of domesticated or cultivated foods. So um, for, for horticulture, you've got this, I guess a, a span of things that are like more or less dependent on people being there and things that could live with or without people. Um, and, Along that line, in, in places like Central Africa, arboriculture is really common. So people are uh, living off of trees and share these very intimate relationships with them. And there's uh, oil palm is a great example. It's common in our, our fast food and Cheetos and things now, but it's an African, uh, it comes from Africa and indigenous peoples used it for the last 9,000 years because it produces oil. You can tap the sort of main stem of it and it makes booze. Um, it's not fully domesticated, but if you look at its DNA, it follows more or less uh, linguistic maps rather than geographic maps, which is kind of fascinating. So people are certainly, um, uh, well, I, I try to at least incorporate like that, that knowledge about what people might not have fully domesticated, but interact with in an in a, in a intensive sort of way. 
Um, yeah, and, and Jay said in the chat, agroforestry is where he was going. And he's, uh, he's, our local, he's, he's our local plant guy, so he would definitely have some good uh, questions like that. And Jay, if you have anything else, feel free to hop on and ask in person if you want. Um, the last little, let me see, last little question. Oh, after our conversation about crocodiles, Christine asked how prevalent snakes were while you were out there in the field. I saw a lot of snakes. That's, you will, um, you will see mambas trying to cross the Congo or whatever river you're on. So you'll just see this like angry green rope. And every time you'll feel the boat move because the guys driving the boat will always, always run over the snake. No questions asked. Yeah. Oh saw, my goodness. I don't think I could work there, Chris. <laughs> yeah, that's, you should see the bathrooms. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of snakes, but it's, what's funny about that is like none of the locals don't tolerate the snakes at all. Like that's, it's one of those things where the risk is too high. So no sensible person would let a snake live, but I, I don't know. I love jungles and snakes and lizards and things that crawl. So I stopped. I'm like, hey, everybody, there's a snake. Isn't that really cool? And somebody's like, quack. I'm like, oh, I killed it. It's my fault. Oh, man. So it, it's not just like they hate them. It's it's an actual part of life, right, to, to avoid. There, there's enough that are so seriously poisonous that, like, imagine, you know, something that had a one in eight chance of killing one of the kids that lived in the village around you. What would you tolerate? That's very true. Yeah, that's all. I, I've seen I've seen people out west deal with rattlesnakes, so this is like this is this is totally true to form for people and venomous reptiles. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it looks like that's the end of our questions in the chat. So, is there anything else? Like any final thoughts you you have, Chris, before we cut this off? Uh, just thanks to everyone for having me. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and take good care of yourselves. Yes, thank you so much for, for being on here. And uh, like I said, we'll have the recording up tomorrow, probably. Cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll make sure to send you the link, Chris, um, so you have it. And oh, that's nice of you. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Have a great night, guys. <laughs>